Showtime! Welcome to the show. I'm Brent Holland, and welcome one and all to Night Fright. Get ready for an incredible ride tonight, folks. We're going to be discussing, amongst other things, the Da Vinci Code, Solomon's Temple, Templar Knights, and Freemasonry. You see, our guest tonight is none other than the legendary... Robert Lomas. That's right, folks. And as most of you know, fans of this show would know, that uh, there's many Freemasons that consider Robert Lomas to be the uh, inspiration for Dan's Brown, Dan Brown's character, Robert Langdon. We're going to be getting to, into all this very shortly, folks. Strap in and hang on. Here we go. <laughs> There is a time to question. There is a time for answers. There is a time to challenge. There is a time to speculate. There is a time for change. There is a time for truth. The time is now. Welcome. To Night Fright, your voice in the dark for Paranormal and Conspiracy Radio. And now your host, Brent Holland. One and all, welcome to the show. I'm Brent Holland. Welcome to Night Fright. Robert Lomas is our guest tonight. We're going to be discussing Freemasons. We're going to be discussing the Da Vinci Code, of course, uh, Solomon's Temple, Templar Knights, and all kinds of things in between. All kinds of things that are mysterious to us all. Of course, Robert Lomas is an author. He's written great books called Secret Legacy of the Knights, Templar, and Origins of Freemasonry, um, The Invisible College, Turning the Templar Key, t- Turning the Solomon Key, amongst many more. I want to welcome Roberts live on the telephone, on Skype, right now, from London, England. How great is that? It's a five-hour difference for him, and uh, he's up in the middle of the night, as I say, doing this show for us. Isn't that terrific? Welcome, Robert. Thank you for joining us tonight. Good evening, Brent, and good evening, listeners, and thank you for having me on the show. I shall enjoy myself this evening. (laughs) Me too. I've sincerely been looking forward to speaking with you for ages since I read The Hiram Key. Mm -hmm. You know, my great-granddad was a Freemason, and uh, from what I'm told, I never knew him because I was just one or two when he passed on. He was a great one for organizing community events. He was a great one for uh, feeding people, uh, all kinds of wonderful community things like that. This is not the typical Freemason that you write about. This is more the person who wants to do good. And there's a, a difference between the two, I guess I could say. Can we start off, perhaps, and tell the folks a little bit about your work, those that may be listening right now, that are not familiar with your work. Yes, I'll be happy to talk about it. But I think your grandfather is is typical of some sort of us of one sort of Freemason. There are there are social Freemasons, there are charitable Freemasons, and there are esoteric Freemasons. So there's it's a it's a very very broad church. There's a whole range of of people who go into it simply for the, the charity and the social side and people who go into it for the, for the spiritual teaching and even the science of it. And uh, so I think your, your grandfather probably falls more towards the charitable and, uh, and social end of the spectrum. You're listening to Night Fright, your voice in the dark for paranormal and conspiracy radio. The time is now. And now your host... Brent Holland. Folks, we are speaking with Robert Lomas. We're talking about Freemasons tonight. We're talking about the secret legacy of the Knights Templar and the origins of Freemasonry. That's one of his books. Another one of his books is The Invisible College, Turning the Templar Key, Turning the Solomon Key. We're going to be touching on the Da Vinci Code, Solomon's Temple. And where I'd like to go right now with you, Robert, if that's okay, is the Templar Knights. Now, again, there seems to be this mystique surrounding the Templar Knights. Um, Some people say they were 
bad. Some people say they were good. Some people say they found a treasure under Solomon's temple. Next thing you know, they were gone. There's all kinds of mystique surrounding them. How does Solomon temple? How does Solomon's temple and the Knights Templar come together? The Knights Templar were actually founded in 1126, and they were founded by a group of knights who met on the site of King Solomon's Temple. So their link with Solomon's Temple is that they were actually founded there. Uh, they lasted until 1307, and then they were, they were actually destroyed on a dawn raid on the Friday the 13th of October, 1307, by King Philip of France. And they were all arrested and they were charged with heresy. So hence the idea that perhaps they were, they were bad people. But there's something that you need to remember about the Knights Templar and about King Philip of France. King Philip of France was actually deeply in debt to the Knights Templar and France was practically bankrupt. Ah. Now, if you are a heretic... Then, and a uh, Christian king challenges your heresy and arrests you, all your goods are forfeit to that king. So if you're going to charge the Knights Templar with anything at all, it's a good idea if you're a bankrupt king to charge them with heresy, because then if you can persuade them to admit that they're heretics very quickly, you can seize all their assets. And particularly when the King of France has got no assets of his own, and is indebted to the Knights Templars personally, it seems quite a good idea from that point of view. So the charge of heresy was political rather than, uh, than religious. Uh, Philip had already carried out a similar action against the Jews three years earlier. He'd actually driven them all out of France and seized all their assets because they were heretics, because they didn't accept the divinity of Jesus. So he, was already, he already had a track record for doing this. So when he invited Jacques de Molay, who was the last Grand Master of the Templars there, Jacques de Molay was not a politically aware man. He arrived in the bankrupt country of France with 36 pack horses laden with silver and carried them into the, uh, into the Paris Temple. Now you think the Paris Temple is probably a, a large fortress, but in fact, the fighting knights of the Knights Templar were all out in, uh, in the Middle East. So the people who were guarding the, the, the Paris Temple were more like bank managers, clerks, and cripples. There was even one leper amongst the guard. So they weren't really fighting knights. Jacques, the only real fighting knights were people like Jacques de Molay, and he was 60-odd. So yes, he'd been a fighter, but he was getting on a little bit. He wasn't at, his, at the peak of his powers. So they, 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 they mounted a dawn raid. The King of France mounted a dawn raid on the Paris Temple. And the ten, the, of course, they just opened the doors and let them in. Once they were in, they arrested the whole lot. And strangely enough, Jacques de Molay confessed to heresy within 24 hours. Uh, he had to be, they had a special meeting of the University of Paris in the Paris Temple to hear his confession and they had to carry him in because unfortunately he'd suffered so much during the, uh, the questioning that he wasn't able to walk. And he complained bitterly after that that he had been tortured and forced to make this confession. But having made the confession, of course the order was branded as heretics, all their goods and chattels were forfeit and a considerable number of them were burnt in France. So the Knights Templar effectively disappeared from the world then. And of course, they become there from then on a blank slate. Because they disappeared so rapidly, because they, uh, they had this wonderful romantic ending where they appeared to be fighting against the forces of the, of the, of the, King, of Fra uh, the King of France, they suddenly become a beautiful myth for people to base other ideas on. That's where the Masonic Knights Templars came from. I see. Okay. Let's continue with that story. By the way, folks, we're speaking with Robert Lomas this, th this evening. If you're just joining us, you can get his books. Easy way to get any books of our, any of our guests, www.nightfrightshow.com. Just click on the book covers of every guest. That will take you right to a place where you can order them 
from the comfort of your own home or simply just go down to your local bookstore and pick up Robert's books. They are readily available. Actually, they take up a good shelf chunk at the <laughs> local bookstore. Uh, some of the books you might want to look at are Secrets Legacy of the Knights Templar and Origins of Freemasonry, and that's what we're talking about right now, the Knights Templar. The Invisible College, Turning the Templar Key, Turning the Solomon Key. We're going to be touching on the Da Vinci Code right now because I want to continue now, Robert, if that's okay with you. Let's go, shall we? We've talked about the Knights Templar very briefly. What's ha what happened to them? Of course, the origins of uh, Friday the 13th when they were decimated, of course. Uh, and this is where that, um, that, that lore about Friday the 13th comes from, folks, is because the Knights Templar were all... Uh, most of them were all killed on Friday the 13th. I want to touch on what happened to them afterwards. Many people even think that some of them may have come to North America, but I want to go to Roslyn, first of all, in Great Britain. Can we go there first, and then perhaps I can get your ideas on if they did come to North America or not? Yes, Roslyn's a very good place to go to if you're interested in who went to North America. Because it was the uh, it was the forerunners of the Earl of Roslyn who built Roslyn Chapel who went to North America, not the Knights Templar. The Knights Templar didn't have a fleet. They hired ships as necessary, cargo ships, and then they let them go. They had no more than six fighting vessels, and these were small fighting vessels kept on the Mediterranean. They weren't capable of crossing the Atlantic. But... There was a group of people who did have ships that were capable of crossing the Atlantic in those days, and these were the Vikings. Now, Roslyn Chapel was built by a, by a Viking, Earl of Orkney. Now, his, great, his grandfather had been a pirate. He was the first, a Viking pirate. The uh, kings of Norway had actually established two colonies, on Greenland, one on Iceland, and another one on the coast of Newfoundland. And the only people who were allowed to trade with these colonies were Viking traders who had been authorized and paid taxes to the King of Norway. But they were beset by various pirates, and one of those pirates was Henry Sinclair, the grandfather of William Sinclair, who built Roslyn Chapel. <coughs> Excuse me. That's okay, Robert. No problem. So, the um, where Henry Sinclair effectively stole Orkney by doing by from the King of Norway, and he became the first Earl of Orkney, and he was trading with Greenland and with Newfoundland. So he was he was effectively a pirate. Now he brought back things like American plants which can be found carved into the stones of Roslyn. So yes, there was traffic going on with there, but it was, it was basically pirate trading that was going on with the, uh, with the, the colonies on the uh, west coast of, Green, of Greenland. Now, his, great, his grandson was a very successful Scottish noble. He actually ended up owning more of Scotland than the kings of Scotland did. He was very ambitious. The earls, of, the, the earls of Roslyn continued to add different domains to them. They became earls of Orkney. They ended up with about 15 different titles, and they owned about two-thirds of the land of Scotland. And they had ambitions upon the crown of Scotland. So what William Sinclair decided to do was to build an alternative focus for the political strength of the people from the Stuarts. Now the Stuarts had a, an abbey called the Abbey of the Holy Rood and the Abbey of the Holy Rood contained a fragment of the true cross that St. Uh, St. Margaret, the wife of, Dun uh, uh, of King Duncan, had brought back from the Holy Land and it was supposed to protect the Stuart kings. The, the symbol of the Holy Rood is, in fact, the symbol of a stag with a cross on its forehead. And the, the, the splinter of the true cross 
that Princess Margaret had brought with her as part of her dowry was reputed to protect her line. And when King David I of Scotland was actually attacked by a stag and it was thought it was going to goad him and, and uh, goad him to death, the, the, uh, the true cross appeared between him and the stag and protected him. Wow. And this showed, of course, that he had a divine right to rule. It's a very useful story to have on your side. And uh, William Sinclair had no, so, had no equivalent to that. He didn't have an Abbey of the Holy Rood. He didn't have a fragment of the true cross to prove that he was a divine, <coughs> excuse, excuse me, a divine okay, ruler. I've got. I've had a stinking cold over Christmas. He, uh, he Listen, was, he, dude, would you like to get a glass of water or something? And I, I can just tell folks uh, who we're speaking with, take a glass of water, folks. Robert Lomas is our guest tonight. How great is that? You know, Robert Lomas. Uh, he's written all kinds of terrific books, primarily about Freemasons, but. Other things, such as what we're discussing tonight, uh, right now, is the Knights Templar, of course. Easy way, as always, to get his books, www.nightfrightshow.com. Click on the book cover. We'll take you right to a place where you can order the book online. Also, folks, if you're listening on the radio right now from coast to coast to coast, three coasts in Canada, of course, you may want to make the Night Fright website a focal point for you because not only can you hear the audio on radio, of course, as always, and the downloads are there for you for your iPods free, of course, but we have something new called Night Fright <coughs> TV, which is essentially an extension of the radio show. Basically, what we do is we're recording all the shows now via Skype, and we're recording... Um, Talking head, if you will, Robert, right now is live over in London, and he's being a super trooper, five-hour difference in the middle of the night for him. He's being terrific about it. But it adds a whole new dimension. Uh, you actually get to see Robert, his uh, articulations, etc. just as I'm using my hands right now, and you won't be able to see that unless you're watching online, www.nightfrightshow.com. Let's go back to those Knights Templar. This is, you know, this is a story, Robert, I have to tell you, that long before the Da Vinci Code, when I was reading your books, that uh, struck me um, as the possibilities of an offspring of Christ. Is that possible? I believe truly that we are all offspring of Christ, um, of, of course in a spiritual sense, but uh, the Da Vinci Code of course goes into it more on a, uh, a tangible level that they believe that, um, well, Dan Brown's story of course is that there is an actual lineage to Christ and Mary Magdalene who um, created a child in, in, uh, in matrimony. Um, do you give much credence to this type of story? Um, you know, as I said at the outset of the show, that um, many Freemasons feel that you were the, uh, the archetype, if you will, for the character Robert Langdon. Yes, I, I, I've heard that said quite a few times. And in fact, uh, when, when Dan Brown was, uh, was um, challenged with, with plagiarism by uh, Michael Bajant, uh, I actually wrote to, to Dan and said, I will happily stand up and speak on your behalf. Because as, a, as an academic scientist, I'm interested in facts. And if, if Dan Brown wants to take those facts and weave a wonderful story from them, uh, I'm quite happy with that. Now, I think it's very unlikely that uh, an offspring, a, a bloodline of Christ survived. That was Michael Bajant's idea. But I do think that the teachings of, of Jesus had a very, very important part to play and that those teachings were embedded into Rosalind Chapel quite deliberately. Now, now one of the things that struck me uh, about Rosalind Chapel uh, is like I originally hail from Montreal. I'm in a place called Kingston right now, which is nestled very nicely between Toronto and Montreal. While I was in Montreal, I was studying Torah, which of course, folks, for you, the, for you folks that are unaware, is the Jewish Bible. Mm. Now, the Star of David is prevalent all throughout this lore. Uh, and I was quite surprised at that because I always considered the Templar Knights, of course, with their crosses on the front of their mm. tunics, uh, devout Christians, if you will. And to to see a Jewish star in there kind of threw me off. What is the significance of that, Robert? Well, the the triangle is is the ancient symbol of the divinity. 
it shows you the, the three aspects of the divinity. And if you want to think of them as the very large, the, uh, the human size and the very small, then you can, you can liken the, you, in terms of physics, you're thinking about relativistic differences in terms of one la the human size, you're talking about Newtonian physics, and in terms of the very small, you're talking about quantum physics. But if you want to interpret these in, ter in terms of the, uh, of the Christian view, then you have God the Father, which is the, the all-knowing, the all enormous creator. You have Jesus the Son, who is the human size aspect of, the, of this triangle. And then you have the Holy Spirit, which is the very small and gets inside your mind. So this symbol, this three-point, this symbol has been very important. And it's the symbol which the Torah says that Enoch, uh, that Moses saw in the burning bush. God appeared to him as a burning as a, as a as a burning triangle. Now the triangle is is usually shown in two ways. There is one triangle with its base on the ground pointing upwards, and there is another triangle with its base in the air pointing downwards. The triangle with its base on the ground pointing upwards symbolizes the power. Oh, you're of breaking things. up again, Robert. Can you come closer to the camera? For some reason, when you're closer to the camera. I don't know what it is. It's much better reception. Okay, we were talking about the triangle of the Star of David. One's pointing up, the, one's pointing down. The lower triangle, with its base on the ground pointing upwards, represents the king with his power based in materialism, and he's pointing towards the heavens for inspiration. And the triangle with its base in the heavens pointing downward represents the power of the priest, with his base in heaven pointing down to guide the king. And when the two merge together to form the interlacing triangles, or the sign of the square and compasses, which you see within Freemasonry, which forms the same shape, then this represents the merging of the temporal power of the king with the divine power of the, of the church together to rule the land. And... Of course, that's a very that's a very important concept that the two must be in balance in order for for the land to be ruled well. If you get a purely temporal king, he becomes a he has the danger of becoming a despot, and if you have a pure if you have a purely priesthood driven ruler, they have the danger of becoming fundamentalists. When you get the two together and a balance between the two, you get a more stable government, and that's the message of that symbol. Oh, isn't that interesting? Because I was always taught that it meant as above, so below. Does that come into it at all? With uh... it, it, it does because effectively, what it's saying to you is that if you're based on the earth looking upwards, yes, sir, then you are mirrored in the skies with something similar. That's the contact of the center that that Freemasonry talks about where your mind can contact the mind of the great architect and become a part of the, of the great plan. And how, how that manifests to you basically depends on what you're expecting to see. As a physicist, I saw the cosmos. I suspect when it happened to St. Paul, he saw, Je he saw Jesus. Can I interrupt you, Robert? Now, when you say you saw the cosmos, was that the energy of the cosmos? Was it more of a feeling than an actual visualization? It felt as though I could actually see all the, all the stars and the whole of space. And it was obviously not real because I was sitting in the front seat of a jeep. And I said, I'd just hear, heard the, the, ele the, electric, the collapse of the electric field. It cut across my, uh, audio, my audio nerves. I'd heard the lightning. And that is well, the most this, this scary thing. This begs another question. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but yeah. um, do you think you had an out-of-body experience? Uh, no, I don't think I left my body, but I okay. think I had, I think I had a trans what uh, you would describe as a transcendental experience. Okay. I had a perception where my sense of self dissolved, but I actually think it was caused by the uh, by the electrical overload on my on my brain. And I think that's something that you can induce by meditation. But the interesting thing is, when you do that, I actually think you make contact with what I could only describe as, as the organizing principle in the universe. 
if you like, the cosmic mind of the great architect. And I think that cosmic mind appears to different people in different ways according to how they interpret the symbols of it. As a, as a physicist, I tend to interpret it in terms of, of, of basically, I write down equations about it and uh, measure the difference in time between hearing the lightning, the electric field of the lightning strike and hearing the, uh, the thunder so I can work out how far away the lightning strike was. It was just over 2,000 feet. Two, sorry, 2,000 2, feet, which is very, very close for a lightning strike. You know, uh, it, it would have scared the bejesus out of me, to tell you the truth. <laughs> uh, it did. There's, there's a moment of almost terror when it, when it starts to happen to you, and you think you've taken on... Uh, I, I actually thought I'd got Thor, the fun, thunder god, sitting on my back seat about to strike me with a hammer. <laughs> and when I looked, there was nothing there. And as I looked, I, got, I saw this great glow expanding from my mind. And I could suddenly, it's like a view of the Hubble telescope. I could suddenly see the stars moving around me. And then I heard the lightning, and that dragged me back. And I started to listen. And then I started to count the time till I heard the thunder. And I could actually work out what had, actually, what had happened from it. That's how I understood what had actually happened what to me. Actually, but, have you been able to achieve that same state uh, through meditation? to this point? Yes, I have. Ah. I have since. It took a long while. And it took a, I knew it was possible. Yes, sir. But it took, it took a long while to, to achieve it again. And there's still the same fear as it starts to overwhelm you. So uh, it, there's, there's almost a threshold of fear you've got to push through for this, to, to experience this rather beautiful moment of enlightenment that you, that you suddenly see. And you come out of it feeling as though you understand things that you didn't understand before. Understood. Folks, Robert Lomas is our, is our guest tonight, if you're just joining us. We're speaking about Freemasonry. We're talking about Knights Templar. We're talking about meditation and the enlightenment of the mind. Um, easy way, as always, if you want to get his books, no problem. www.nightfrightshow. Dot com. Just click on the book cover. As always, we'll take you right to a place where you can order the book. Actually, in this case, folks, it'll take you right to Robert's website where you'll get more information about his work, his books, and also contact information, too, as I'm sure Robert would be open to uh, an email or two. Let's continue now. Let's go back to Solomon's Temple. Now, I, I know there's always that lore, if you will, King Solomon's Temple had this wonderful, huge um, treasure beneath it. Mm -hmm. And it's reputed that the Knights Templar, of course, found this treasure and then took a beeline right out of there as soon as they found it. And by the way, folks, there was only six Knights Templar in the beginning. Um, can we go back to the very genesis of that? Of, of King Solomon's Temple? Yes, sir. And it, then just yep. continue from there. King Solomon's Temple was actually a very interesting building because we're not even sure if it really exists. But it was actually a model of a, of a temple which had, which had been built by King Hiram of Tyre. King Hiram of Tyre had actually built, moved the city of Tyre out onto an artificial island in the Mediterranean, and he built a temple on there which, had, which was the prototype for King Solomon's temple. Now, when Solomon wanted to build a house for Yahweh, he went to Hiram, who was probably the foremost civil engineer of, the, of that period of time, about 1000 BC. And uh, he consulted with him on how it should be built, and Hiram supplied the workmen. Now, the whole myth of Freemasonry talks about what Hiram built for King Solomon, why it was built the way it was, and the fact that beneath it, there was a secret vault. And in that secret vault was a great treasure. But the interesting thing is the great treasure is, not, is knowledge of yourself. And it's knowledge of how you can contact the, the great architect. That's, the, that's what's stored in the secret vault of Freemasonry. And it teaches you how to access that. And the vault is actually within yourself. So the, whenever Freemasonry talks about a temple and the Temple of Solomon, it's talking about you building yourself and constructing your own mind and consciousness to be able to become aware of the divine spark which is within you, which makes you aware of 
everything else within reality. So there has been no evidence, if you will, that uh, perhaps the original remnants of Christ's cross, for example, was in there, or the Ark of the Covenant, um, the things of that nature. The uh, the Ark of the Covenant disappeared quite a while. It was before the temple was de- Solomon's temple was destroyed. I see. Uh, the the ro- the Holy Royal Arch degree of Freemasonry tells of the Temple of Zerubbabel, which was the rebuilding of the temple after after the fall of Babylon, and that did happen. That's a real temple we know about, and the the temple which the remnants of which exist in Jerusalem now, was built by King Herod. So he rebuilt that temple. So effectively, we know of two temples that have been on on Jerusalem, Zerubbabel's temple and Herod's temple. Solomon's temple was reputedly built on the site beforehand, but Freemasonry tells another story, which may or may not be true, and probably is just a beautiful myth, that Solomon's temple was built on the site of an even older temple that was built by the prophet Enoch. And that's where you get the story of the the, the triangle within the circle appearing. Ah. That was the golden plate which God etched for Enoch, which Enoch put in a secret vault beneath his temple, which Solomon discovered when he built his temple on the site. And that that plate was passed down. That's fascinating, absolutely fascinating. Folks, you must be riveted to your seat as I am because this is exciting stuff for me. This is Robert Lomas, of course, folks. He's on the on the line live from London. If you're watching online, of course, uh, we're doing it via Skype. Uh, www.nightfrightshow.com. He's being a super trooper tonight, as I said before. He's five hours ahead of us, the middle of the night for him, and he's just being wonderful about it. And I'm learning a ton, stuff I didn't know. Um, You know, you read a lot, you learn a lot, and you listen to this show, and you think you know something, and then all of a sudden, a fellow by the name of Robert Lomas comes on and just blows you away. Of course, none better. His books are Secrets Legacy of the Knights Templar, Origins of Freemasonry, The Invisible College, Turning the Templar Key, Turning the Solomon Key, and we're going to be touching on Da Vinci Code, which we're doing right now, Uh, Solomon's Temple, which we've just discussed, Templar Knights we've discussed. Let's go back where we started it all off with uh, Robert Wood and Freemasonry. Now, you were saying it was in the 1300s that Freemasonry finally became a religion, yet it was around before that. It's what? not a, rel- it's not a oh, religion. Okay, okay it, go ahead. It, it, Explain it's a, that it's for a, us, it, 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 It's a spiritual philosophy. Ah, because okay. it makes no statements whatsoever about religion. It's very, very careful to use neutral symbols for the for the divinity. Oh, I see. Okay, for the day. Yeah, and the reason for this is that it welcomes anybody of any belief into as long as you can express a belief that there is an order to be found at the center of the universe. Yes, whatever you want to call it, you can call it the laws of physics. You can call it God. You can call it Jesus. You can call it Muhammad. You can call it Yahweh. You can, you can call it Krishna. Freemasonry doesn't mind what you call it as long as you believe there is something there to study and to make contact with. So it's a spiritual philosophy rather than a religion because it doesn't have any dogma about what you should believe about the great architect. It uses these wonderful neutral terms, the, the great architect, the grand geometrician, the great overseer, all of which suggest a a rather wonderful sort of being. I mean, the grand geometrician really appeals to me as a physicist, because if you think about uh, what Euclid said, he said that uh, that mathematics are the thoughts of God. And one of the ways you can study the uh, the hidden mysteries of nature and science is through mathematics. Mm -hmm. And of course, that started with with the formation of the Royal Society back in the 1600s in, uh, in Britain. And that was formed by Freemasons, and particularly by a Freemason called Sir Robert Murray. And they basically set up modern science so that they could study the hidden mysteries of nature and science without being told that they were heretics. Because that was only 30 years after Galileo had been put under house arrest for daring to suggest that that the, uh, the earth might be going around the sun. 
Imagine yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, a, what a dreadful heresy that was, eh? How dare he? Has there always been a conflict between organized religion and Freemasonry? Uh, there isn't a great conflict with, uh, with a lot of it. Most of the conflict stems from the period of... Um, after the uh, the Jacobites and the Hanoverians in in England, there was a, there was a, a line of kings called the Stuarts, and they sort of they were mainly Catholics, and of course England was Protestant, mm -hmm. and James II was a Catholic, and he was driven out as a king, and he became he formed an order called the Jacobites, and the Stuart kings had traditionally been patrons of Freemasonry. So you found that Freemasonic Free lodges tended to be um, loyal to the, uh, to the Stuarts. So in order to distance themselves from it, a Grand Lodge was formed in London in 1717, which is two years after the 1715 Jacobite Rebellion, so that the, the Freemasons of London could say, we're not really Jacobites, we're not really supporters of King James, we are in fact loyal to the Hanoverians, and that's where you got the this this sudden this sudden split, and in fact the Masonic Knights Templar came out of a group called the Royal Order of Scotland, oh, and the Royal Order of Scotland was a Masonic movement, which claimed as its rightful leader the King of Scots, and at the time it was created James II, the King in exile, was the King of Scots, so they kept an empty chair for him in the Royal Order. And it was a cover for the Jacobites. So originally, the Masonic Knights Templar were a cover for Jacobite organizations to support the, uh, the, the deposed Stuart kings. And it wasn't until that line died out that it suddenly became less of a threat. So there's a lot of, a lot of, uh, of politics going went on in those days between the Jacobites and the Hanoverians. And uh, there's, there's a Hanoverian strain of Freemasonry and a Jacobite strain of Freemasonry, which is the older one, which came from Scotland with the, with the Stuart Kings. Now, Robert, Robert Lomas is our guest tonight, by the way, folks. How did this spread across the globe? Well, the thing about, free, about, the thing about Freemasonry is that it teaches you an awful lot about yourself. It teaches you the art of memory. It teaches you the art of public speaking. It actually makes you a better and more effective and more creative person. And the original lodge where, where it started in Aberdeen was a group of, of masons who were made redundant when William Sinclair's estates were seized from him. And they were the, the masons who'd built Roslyn. Now, you know the story that William passed over Roslyn to his, young, to his son Oliver so that it, Oliver could complete the temple, don't you? Could you tell the folks that story for, for those uh, that are listening right now that may not be aware of that? Well, William, William Sinclair, who built Roslyn Chapel, passed over, didn't finish the chapel, and he passed it over his, to his son to complete the work. The reason he passed it over to his son was that he'd mounted this, this plan to take the crown of Scotland. And he'd employed an architect called Gilbert Hay to build Roslyn Chapel. And Roslyn Chapel had all the beautiful myths of Celtic, Celtic myths. It has green men. <coughs> it has Jewish myths. It has the stories of the fallen and angels. You've seen yourself the, the triangles and the interlaced triangles, the two pillars. All the wonderful myths that associate with Solomon's Temple. So what Gilbert Hay was rebuilding was a spiritual focus point so that he could, William Sinclair could replace the Abbey of the Holy Rood and displace the Stuart line. Now, he mounted a rebellion and the aim was to partition Scotland and it failed. So the Lord of the Isles was going to take the West part, Edward of England was going to take the Lowlands, and William Sinclair was going to take the remainder of Scotland from Lothian to Orkney. But the whole thing fell apart. And the plot was scuttled. The Stuart kings were secured on the throne. And William's estates were broken up. And Roslyn was passed over to his son Oliver when Oliver was 12 months old. So he wasn't the strong young man to carry over the work. Mm -hmm. 
So mm. William Sinclair built Roslyn using Gilbert Hay as an architect as a counterweight to this uh, to the Abbey of the Holy Rood, and that was going to be his spiritual focus. But of course, when his estates were broken up, it wasn't used. But the stonemasons who'd learned how to carve these powerful symbols into stone and learnt the power of these myths from Gilbert Hay then ended up working on St. Nicholas's Kirk in Aberdeen, which was the only big building project going on in Scotland. And they created a wonderful document called the Kirkwall Scroll. And the Kirkwall Scroll was created in the late 1400s, and it has all the symbols of Freemasonry on it. So from then on, they taught the symbols and how the symbols can be used to pass on great messages that can't easily be put into words. And the rituals of Freemasonry were then developed to explain these wonderful symbols. So the symbols of Freemasonry, which were learned from Roslyn Chapel by these Freemasons, actually founded the order, and the rituals which, ex which sensitize uh, an individual to how these symbols work and how to read them was uh, was created by this group of people by uh, brother alexander stewart was the first master of the first masonic lodge in the world and and it carries on to this day wow what a story now is there any evidence robert of any temples being built in north america that are in similar statue stature uh, not, not from, not from that period. I mean, there's lots of Masonic temples been built, Understood. been built since. since. Understood. Yes. But I, I guess what I was referring to is, in the same sense that Roslyn was built, um, as a replicant, if you will, of Solomon's Temple, if there was anything uh, of similar nature here in North America. Uh, there, there are odd. There are a few odd things which are mainly Viking. You've got the Westford Knight, and you've also got quite a bit of evidence of a Viking colony that was built along the coast of Newfoundland. Can you but tell us are, about those? Uh, the Westford Knight is basically a, a, a stone carving of a, uh, which affect, It looks like a. Um, it's a knight with his sword, and it's it's basically a burial marker of the sort that the Vikings used, because uh, although the Knights Templar used a used a used a gravestone which just showed the sword of a knight, yes, sir. this was also used by the Vikings, and a lot of the of the the graves that have been found in the north of Scotland which were at one time assumed to be Templar graves because they had these stones carved on, these swords carved into stone, have turned out to be Viking. And, of course, the link between the Vikings and Roslyn is through the Earls of Orkney. And so there were, the Westford Knight is a carving that was done probably by a, by a Viking group. The Vikings were trading with North, with North America. They were trading for furs, they were trading for various various um, various specialized forms of timber and things that they used. So they there was it wasn't the Knights Templar. It was in fact the Vikings who uh, I told that story in a book called Turning the Templar Key with all the all the detail of it. That's right. But but you have to remember that Freemasonry actually has two histories. It has a mythical history which tells the story how its myths came together and how they're used in teaching. And it has a mundane history. And its mundane history started in Aberdeen when they put together these wonderful myths and these wonderful, these wonderful symbols and started to use them to teach you to know yourself better and to teach you how to relate to the great architect and how to make contact with the great architect. And Freemasonry has been doing that for the last 600 years, using symbols, myth, and metaphor right. as, a means of, as a means of teaching. And that's why I wrote the little book, The Secret Science of Masonic Initiation, which describes the mythical history. So I write some books which are, which are actual facts about history, what really happened. But there's also this wonderful mythical history, which is what you learn if you go through the craft and it teaches you these meditative techniques which actually help make you a more creative person. 
so this is nothing to fear or anything. This is not some kind of um, cult or something. Uh, it is not after uh, no. world control. Go ahead. No, there is there is no Masonic god. The god that a, as a Freemason worships is his, his, his own god. Exactly. But you learn neutral symbols so that you can talk with people who believe in different versions of God. So you can use, if you want to talk with, with your Jewish brethren or your Muslim brethren and there are, or your Hindu brethren, and we have, and in my lodge there are members of each of those religions within the lodge, then you use the neutral term, volume of the sacred law, to talk about your sacred book, which may be the Bible, maybe the Torah, maybe the Quran. There are different, each one has its own specialized sacred, sacred books. And you use the term the great architect to symbolize the organizing principle that, it, that, rules the, that, that creates and rules the cosmos without ascribing any particular attributes which are peculiar to, to a religion. That's for you to settle between, between you and your God, not something for the lodge. The lodge is concerned with the things all, all, all people who accept there's order in the universe hold in common, not with the way they differ. Understood, sir. Folks, we're speaking with Robert Lomas tonight. He is live on the phone from London, England. And if you're watching online, of course, we're using Skype as always. Easy way to get his books as always, folks, www.nightfrightshow. Dot com. Just click on the book cover. We'll take you right to a place where you can get the book online from the comfort of your own home. Also, folks, if you want more information on Robert's work, that link will take you right to Robert's personal website. There's contact information there. There's a list of his books. There's a list, a list of his teachings. There's DVDs available. There's a whole range of material there for you. Of course, um, it, many Masons feel that it was uh, Robert Lomas that was the inspiration for Dan Brown's uh, character Robert Langdon in the movie The Da Vinci Code. So um, this man has great ability without question. And as I started out the show saying my great granddad was a Mason and he was proud of it and we were very proud of him as well. He used to go around and help all kinds of folks. Uh, so um, I don't know where perhaps this Freemason world conquering came from but certainly that was not my granddad in any <laughs> sense <laughs> he was too busy feeding folks um robert what's next for you my friend uh, i'm working on a book at the moment uh, with with my favorite editor the uh i'm with mark booth who uh, who first who edited the whole of the, the hiram key series has uh, been talking to me for a while he's just set up a new imprint with hodder and he's asked me to uh, to write a book I've always wanted to write. I've been always been interested in the link between Freemasonry and science. I wrote The Invisible College about the historical link. But I actually think the practice of Freemasonry and the symbolic reasoning gives a portal into a view of quantum the view of quantum physics that makes perfect scientific sense. And that's what I'm writing at the moment. I'm looking at the links between quantum physics and, uh, and Freemasonry. Can you just give us a, maybe expand on that a little bit and give us a brief synopsis of a little bit without giving too much away? Yes, well, basically, the, once I realized there was a, there was a uh, once I realized that there was a mental state where you appeared to be contacting with something else, which happened to me when I had the lightning strike, I then set out to try and find if I could achieve that state of mind without the need to, being, to be struck by lightning. Because obviously it's a, it's a fairly dangerous practice, and I, if, I'd, if I hadn't have been lucky, I, I probably would have been cooked. So, so it's, it's not, not the best way to achieve this state of mind. So what I started to do was to look, more closely at the the, at the esoteric teachings of Freemasonry. So I joined, a, I eventually I found a, a lodge founded by a gentleman called Walter Wilmshurst, who you may have heard of. He's written a number of classic Freemasonry books, particularly one called The Meaning of Masonry. Now he died in about 1940, but he founded a lodge which was specifically for investigating the spiritual training side of Freemasonry and what it teaches. And he was actually quite uh, an aware science student. 
He turned, ended up as a solicitor, but he, started, but he trained first of all as a scientist. And he was very interested in what he saw as the newly developing science of the quantum and the science of relativity. And he thought that this gave aspects of reality which Freemasonry helped you understand. And as a physicist, I got quite fascinated by this, and I think he's right. I think that as the universe has evolved, then there are groups of poss there are groups of intelligences elsewhere in the universe, and they may be too far away for us to contact, because of course the universe is a very very big place, and light slows down the speed with which 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 things can happen. But the one thing we do know is that if we observe things at the absolute limit of our of the range of our telescopes, we're looking back 14 billion years, there are things that, you, that a physicist would call uncollapsed clouds of, rea of, uh, of reality. Oh, now, when you, ob when you observe those, you actually form them into objects. And this is the basic idea of quantum physics. Nothing has a past until it's observed. So by looking into the past, we actually create a pattern in that past which makes it possible for us to appear. So effectively, if there are other consciousnesses elsewhere in the universe, beyond the range of our of SETI, for example, or beyond the range where we can actually contact them, then they can also be looking at things in the past and collapsing realities. And we would see the laws that they would be creating, and they would see the laws that we are creating. And I think there's an idea that was put forward by... Um, uh, a physicist called John Wheeler, that the universe actually creates itself by observing itself, and that's what brings us about as intelligent entities. And that's the idea I'm in interested in investigating. That is absolutely fascinating. Now, these realms of consciousness, if you will, do they exist on our plane, in our dimension, or would they be kind of outside our dimension? <laughs> They're within space-time. There's only, there's only four dimensions that actually matter, three of space and one of time. But there's an interesting idea put forward by a physicist called Paul Dirac, yes, who, who's, who's the father of, uh, basically the father of all integrated circuits. He's the guy who discovered how to make the, uh, the, uh, the solid-state physics that underpin all of the integrated circuits that drive our computers and are making it possible for us to talk now. And he gave birth to two interesting theories of physics, one of which seems to have stalled, and that's the theory of think string theory, which says there are in fact 12 dimensions to reality and that uh, seven of them are folded up so small you can't really see them. Now, if they find the Higgs boson in the Large Hadron Collider, then that view of reality will be vindicated. But if they don't, we've got to look for something else. And Paul Dirac put forward another idea. He said that all the granules of space, very, very tiny granules of space-time, are like little tiny spheres. And they're very, very tiny, about 10 to, the, oh, 10 to the minus 35 centimeters across. That's the Planck distance. And what happens is that between them, there is a non-relativistic, what he called an interstitial ether. And what can happen is that when you separate two particles that have been created out of the vacuum, they become entangled through this interstitial ether, and they can communicate instantaneously without the, without the restriction of the speed of light. And can, if you have particles in your mind that were once paired with particles that are in the mind of another intelligence, and that intelligence thinks a thought, you get that thought mirrored if you're... If you're concentrating on it Just like and that. when you're meditating you're concentrating on allowing your mind to be open to these entangled transitions and this so there's, there's there's some real science behind it absolutely this is exciting this exciting new field for you isn't it uh it's something i've been looking at for about five or six years now wow. and uh it, it's it holds together mathematically and the the challenging thing is to is to explain the physics in in simple enough terms to so that people can follow it 
to the layperson such as me, for example. We, because, yeah, go ahead. Because of course, because my background is I'm a, I'm a my PhD is in quantum physics, so I'm uh, I'm comfortable with talking in mathematics. But Mark Booth is a wonderful editor from forcing me to to. Uh, to talk sense to people, because he just says, Robert, you're writing nonsense, I can't understand a word of it. <laughs> Explain it to me more simply. <laughs> That's funny. Robert, we're going to wrap up now, but I sincerely want to thank you for taking the time out of your night. Uh, folks, of course, Robert Lomas is our guest tonight, and uh, he's on the phone live from London, England. Um, Five hours difference, it's the middle of the night for him, and uh, he's taken the time out to speak with us on our show today. Easy way to get information about Robert, just go right to his website, and that link is on the www.nightfrightshow.com website. Also, this show, that if you're listening on the radio, this show will be there for the video. Uh, you can just click on that link just to the left of tonight's guest, and that'll take you right to a place where you can watch the video online. This has been sensational, my friend, and I know you've done work on Tesla, so we've got to talk about Tesla <laughs> next time you come back, and it's just been terrific. And I, again, I just sincerely do want to thank you for taking the time out of your night, the middle of your night for us. Yeah, I would, I would love to talk about Tesla. He's one of my scientific here. I do write about science as well as Freemasonry. But one, one, last, one last little fact for you, Brent. Yes, sir. I'm actually also a Canadian Freemason. I'm a member of the Solomon Lodge of Research in Saskatchewan. In Saskatchewan. And, I, right. and I attend that lodge via, via Skype. So I can actually attend it. On, it meets four times a year on, a, on Saturday evenings. And uh, fortunately, it's, it's there Saturday afternoon, so it's not too late at night for me. And uh, my good friend Heath Armbruster, who's the, the master of that lodge at the moment, takes his laptop in and I attend on the laptop. That's wonderful. Isn't Skype great? It's true. I mean, it's wonderful. You know, uh, to think that I can speak to uh, a living person that's over in London right now, it's just bringing the whole world together mm. uh, much, much more quickly than we had ever anticipated years ago. And it's wonderful. It's terrific, you know. But, but to, be able to, uh, to be able to attend. Uh, a Canadian lodge of research where I can share, I can give them papers and listen to them via the, via, via the computer link. I wouldn't have the time to do it if I had to spend a week traveling each way oh, yeah. for each meeting. But over Skype, I can do it. So it, it's a wonderful, it's, and we've got Paul Derek to thank for that. <laughs> there you go. It's a wonderful time to be alive. Thank you, my friend. All the very best to you. And do come back very soon, my friend. Thank you very much, Brent. I'd be delighted to come back. You, you just have to invite me. There you go, mate. And that will be soon enough. All the very best. Bye-bye for now. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Robert. I'm Brent Holland from Night Fright. Thank you all for listening. See you next time. <laughs>